That, that means that Jesus Christ is Lord. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Now, that's the way to be saved. He says, if you will confess with your mouth, say it with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. He says, salvation is yours. Now, he didn't say if you feel anything. You don't have to feel anything. Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? Yes. All right. Say it with your mouth that Jesus is Lord of your life. Jesus is Lord of my life. That's salvation. Really? But I don't feel anything. He didn't say if you felt something. Somebody say, yeah, but that's just the letter. Oh, that's not the meaning of the letter killeth the spirit giveth life. That's not the meaning. Let me explain the meaning when it says the letter killeth the spirit giveth life. What is the letter he's talking about? The law. When he says the letter, he's not talking about this book. You have to study it in the context in which he presents it. He says the letter, the law kills. Why? Because the law, another name for the law of Moses was the law of sin and death. That's another name for the law of Moses. It was called the law of sin and death. The law of Christ is called the law of life. Or the law of the spirit of life and Paul declared he said the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death that means set me free from the law of Moses because the law of Moses brought condemnation in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 he says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not after the flesh. Now that means, who walk not after the senses. That means, who do not live according to their feelings. Who do not live according to their sights, but according to the spirits. How does somebody live according to the spirits? Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirits and they are life. If you live according to the written word of God, you are living according to the spirits. For the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Can you see it now? When Satan tempted Jesus, what did Jesus do? He said, if thou be the son of God, if you are the son of God, command the stones to be made bread. Jesus didn't say, all right, I will prove to you today. <laughs> what did Jesus do? He said, Satan... It is written. He didn't say, Satan, I can feel it. He didn't say, I feel anything. He said, it is written. It is written. When the devil reminds you of your sin, remind him of Calvary. In Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin cannot have dominion over me. I don't have to sin. I can live above it. It does not have dominion over me. Hallelujah. Why? Because, you see, the power of sin has been broken. I do not live according to my senses. I live according to the Spirit. The moment you understand this principle, you will not have to struggle again in your life. Let me tell you what Satan tries to do to you. Listen. Satan is not after making you do wrong. You have to understand this. He is not after trying to get you to do something wrong. Did you know that? Some people think that Satan pushes them to do something wrong. No, that's not his job. He's not trying to make you sin. Young lady, hi. 
You awake? <laughs> yeah, you look like you are. Satan is not trying to make you sin. He doesn't care about whether or not you sin. You know why? Because sin, <laughs> he is aware. The Bible says Jesus got sin nailed to the cross. Sin has been nailed to the cross. Hey, hear me. It's important for you to know this. I said Satan doesn't care about whether or not you sin because in the presence of God he knows that doesn't work. You know why? Sin has been nailed to the cross. You say, how was sin nailed to the cross? I'll tell you. Let's look at the book. You ready? Second Corinthians. So you are not having a sin problem. Someone says, I've been struggling with sin in my life. <laughs> that is not your problem. I'll show you what your real problem is. The moment you settle that problem, sin will no longer be a problem to you. You will realize that you were set free a long time ago. Second Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> Read verse 21. One to go. Again, read that line again. One to go. Again. Again. One more time. Go on. Did you notice he said he had made him to be what? Did he say he had made him to be a sinner? He had made him to be what? Sin. To be sin. He made Jesus sin. Did you, did you catch that? The Bible says Jesus became sin. Our sins were laid on Jesus. He became our sin bearer. He didn't stop there. Our very nature of sin, the very thing that caused us to do wrong, was laid on his spirit. He was made sin for us who knew no sin. That we might become, did you see that, the rest part of it? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when Jesus was nailed to the cross, sin was nailed to the cross. Let me show you another thing. Do you remember what Jesus said? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Is that making sense to you now? He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up. How come he typified himself with a serpent? Why? How could he be typified with a serpent? Because when he would be nailed to the cross, he would be seen. The serpent typifies sin. And it was made of bronze. You remember that? The brazen serpent. And brass in the Bible refers to judgment. And when that was raised up, everybody that was beaten of a serpent, Moses said, if you have been beaten of a serpent, look at this one and you will leave. Some said, look. How can I just look at the brazen serpent and leave? Huh? Go. He died. He said, if you have been beaten of a serpent and you're dying, look at this one. All you have to do is look. It's recorded in his word. Hallelujah. And it's only that you look 
and leave. Look and leave, my brother, leave. Look to Jesus now and leave. It's recorded in His Word. Hallelujah, and it's only that you look and leave. One more time, come on. Look and leave, my brother, leave. Look to Jesus now and leave. That you look and leave. That's all. He said, all you have to do is look. They had been bitten by serpents. And they were dying. But the Bible says they died by the thousands. It was a plague. And Moses lifted up a brazen serpent. He said, God says. Everybody in the camp, hear me. He said, God says, if you will look up, look at this serpent of brass, even though you have been bitten by that venomous beast, you will be healed and you will leave. They were struggling on the ground. Somebody said, I might just try. Let me try. I'm almost dying. If only I could look. And finally, he just got a glimpse of it. He said, oh God, I'm here. I'm healed. And he said to the other one, look. He said, no, I can look. He said, look, I'm already healed. Come on, look. Moses says to look, look. All you have to do is look. He said, no, no, no. That's deception. How can I look at another serpent? I've already been bitten here. I can't look. Oh, please do. Look, uh, you're dying. Look, why don't you look and leave? He says, no, I don't think I can look. I I'm dying already. I don't think I can look. And he died. All right, what about over you? Hey, come here. Hey, look. Can you look? Hey, yeah, I I'll try. Come on, look. All you have to do is look and you'll be healed. He says, I'll try. Oh, yes, you're right. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. That's what salvation is all about. Hallelujah. Yep. Don't try to be what you already are. Don't try to have what you already have. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, Salvation is yours. It is settled. Sin has been nailed to the cross. God's not trying to make you stop sinning. Why? Because he has given you a life that has dominion over sin. It's because you have not seen that life. It's in you, but you have not looked at it. You haven't put it to work. The Bible says, Reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God. I'm alive to God. You know what it means to be alive to God? It means to be awakened to the realms of God. It means to be awakened to the holiness of God. Do you do wrong anymore? Oh yes, you may. Why? Because you're growing. You're like a child taking his steps to walk. You may fall a dozen times. Doesn't make any difference. Listen, when a child is born, he doesn't start walking overnight, does he? But he's still human. And then after a while, he starts learning to sit. After a while, he starts learning to creep. After a while, he starts learning to stand. After a while, he starts trying to walk like others. And then before long, he's trying to walk faster. And then before long, he's trying to run, go with the God. Now, when he's trying to walk and he falls, do you say, now I know you're not a real human being? <laughs> or because a child is creeping, 
Do you say, ah, this child is creeping, this is not a human being, this is a dog? That's why you have to understand when you were born again, you were born with the very nature of God. You are like Him. The Bible says we have been recreated in the image of Him that created us. We are exactly like Him. Are you hearing me? Sin is not your master. The power of sin has been removed from your life. When you do wrong, it's not because you love to do wrong. Can you imagine you have to be tempted to do wrong? Can you understand that? And when you do wrong, there is a provision. Hallelujah. He said, these things I have written unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, if you sin he didn't say when you sin why because you don't have to sin he says if it happens if you sin he says we have a lawyer we have a lawyer a qualified advocate are you hearing me he's the counsel for the defense glory to god he says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not for us only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know what that Jesus, but look, it's so important. We've got to catch this truth. This Jesus, the Bible says, the same night in which he was betrayed. Got his disciples together. <sighs> Can I show you something? How important this event was in the mind of Jesus. It was so important that they did not know. Nobody knew when Jesus made the arrangements. Can you see it? He had to make a private arrangement. He didn't need anybody to disturb this event. He talked to one of his disciples and nobody knew when Jesus did it. He got to a certain man. He said, listen, I'm coming to your house. I've got something special to do in your house. Listen, Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, Matthew, and the rest of them, they know nothing about it. And Jesus had this dialogue with this precious disciple of his. And said, I'll be coming to your house for the Passover. That's the last night I've got here. And I want you to get prepared. I'll let you know the hour. Just prepare a room in your house for me, all right? And the guy said, all right, sir. He said, don't tell anybody. I'll let you know exactly when. Nobody had the record when Jesus discussed with that man. At the appointed time. The disciples were wondering, Master's not talking about, they said, Master, where are you going to eat the Passover? He said, relax. At the appointed time, he called his disciples together. He said, now I want you to go. He had a word of knowledge. He knew exactly where that man would be at that time. He said, I want you to go to such and such a street, to such and such a house. He said, you will meet, you find a man bearing a pitcher of water. He said, when you see him, say to him, the master wants to know whether the place is ready. Because you'll be coming here. Now notice, they did not ask the man his name. The man didn't have to ask them who they were. Because the man knew who they were. So when they said the master, because he'd been one of the disciples, he knew the 12 that used to follow Jesus around. He was one of them in the crowd who loved Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You remember Sons of Consolation? This was one of them. One of the Sons of Consolation. When everybody was bitter about Jesus and the whole land was filled with bitterness, hatred, unbelief, 
Fear was in the air. It was an hour you didn't know who to trust. Even Judas Iscariot was negotiating the master at a price. Jesus had this disciple he could trust. And he knew this man would not betray him or let anybody know where he was. And he talked with him and prepared. And then the man said, let the master know everything is all right. And Jesus came there secretly with his disciples. That night, tell somebody, say, I'll never forget.